Hey everybody, thanks so much for joining us today. I hope the content encourages you and helps you build your faith. Now enjoy the message. With the Lord's authority, I say this. Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Verse 23, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And do not let sin, by, and, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Great rule in marriage. We will not go to sleep at night until we've settled this anger between us. Verse 28. If, a thief quit, if, if, if you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to those in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. How important is that in marriage? And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Here it is, verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. So uh, my wife, whom I just absolutely love dearly, right? She's wonderful. Uh, you're just the best, babe. Um, unfortunately, the one thing that she doesn't have going for her is she doesn't know how to operate the thermostat. <laughs> I, now, listen, I am not, and, and I've got my things, too. I, d I don't know how to put my shoes away, right? I just come in, take them off, leave them at the front door, and, and, you know, I just forget that there's a bin right around the corner. You know, she reminds me often, but I just forget about it, that there's a bin there that I can put my shoes away in. But for her, she just has forgot, she, she, and I'm not talking about, like, to a, a level of comfort. I'm talking about the functionality of the actual device, right, that is against the wall. So when the house is cold and she wants it warm, I'm saying put it on auto, bump it a degree or two, 72, and then what will happen is the house will warm to 72 and then it will automatically shut off, right? No. What does she do? She says, I'm cold. She turns it on. She goes to 75. And she leaves that thing blowing heat all day long in the house. I mean, I'm, t I'm trying to tell her, I'm like, babe, listen, like, what, you don't realize what two degrees can do on a thermostat, right? Let me tell you, two degrees is a game changer. Fellas, are you with me? Two degrees, 68, I'm sleeping like a baby. 70, I'm sweating, kicking blankets off of me, trying to just keep the sheet on, and I I'm a mess, right? It's a, two degrees changes things. Anna only counts in fives with the thermostat. She's like, I don't feel it unless I go up five to ten, right? So then all of a sudden what happens is the thing's on, on. I've, I've explained auto a million times, but it's not, we're, we're not going to mess with auto. We want it blowing the whole day, right? So it goes on, it goes up to 77, and I get home 5, 530, and the house is a furnace. And I'm like, that woman... I go instantly the second I walk in there, I'm like, something has got to change in this house. I thought about, you know how, I bet the school has them. You go and you see those little cages over the thermostat that got a key, you know, that you can't get into unless you got the key. That's what I've been like, you know what, I'm going to get one of them cages. And I'm going to have one key made, and, you know, when she goes up there to change it, she's going to have to call me, and we'll, we'll see, you know. Um, but anyway, when I, th there is something that happens. When I go outside, and it's 40 degrees. 
right? I, I'm like, okay, great. It's the winter. I know summer is coming. There's nothing I can do about it. I just endure it, right? I just live through it knowing that things will change. It will become different. When I walk into my house and it's 77 and the furnace is blowing, I instantly think I have to change something. The second I walk in, I'm like, I got to change something about this place. That's the difference in seasons and cycles. Seasons change with time. Cycles change when you do. There's a huge difference. I was talking with a friend of mine this past week. We were sitting at Chick-fil-A eating it. You know, you don't even have to pray over your food at Chick-fil-A. It's already been prayed over a hundred times. There's worship music playing and everything. And so we're sitting at Chick-fil-A and we're eating, right? And, and he asked me, he said, let me ask you a question about, about something. I said, man, yeah, shoot. And he asked me, he said, hey, I got a, a bazillion kids at home. I think he's got four, four kids at home. They're all under five or six years old. And he said, man, life just feels like I have no time right now. He's like, literally, I just have no time. I wake up early, I go to bed late, and it is every single day. I've just, I'm, I'm taking care of kids. And I said, here's the beauty about that. That's a season. Seasons change with time. As time goes by, your kids are going to grow up. They're going to become more self-sufficient. They're going to eventually go to school. Parents, can we praise God for school in this place? When they go to school, summers, we're like, no, nah! <laughs> got to have them every day. No. They go to school, they become more self-sufficient. And that is a season in life that will change itself based on time. The difference would be, hey, in my marriage, we don't stop fighting. We've been fighting for eight years, and all eight years, it's the same thing. She drives me crazy. I get angry, yell at her. I shut down. She provokes me to talk, and it just happens over and over. We've had kids. We have moved houses. We've had a job change. I'm at a different place, but it's still happening. That's a cycle. That's a cycle that will only change when you change. That's not a season. The problem is we try to fix cycles the same way we fix seasons. Just give it time. Time heals all wounds. My brother Scott last week said that is a lie. Oh, time will just, no, no, no. You don't fix a cycle the same way you fix a season. A season, you endure. Time will change it. A cycle, you've got to fix something. You've got to change something. And hey, listen to me, this, this would be a perfect time for me to share with you. I, I never come here and preach at you. I preach with you. Man, if anyone needs to hear this message, it's me. Because I got some things I need to fix. I got some cycles that I need to break. But if anyone else needs to hear the message, it's you as well. If you're sitting here right now and you're thinking to yourself, man, I hope they're listening. I hope they're catching this because they got some cycles that they need to break. Man, I wish my spouse was here because they're the ones I got. Maybe that's the first cycle that you need to break is that cycle of deflection, that cycle of blame, that cycle of instantly thinking like you're the one who's right and they've got something wrong with them. So here is our opportunity. We're talking about cycles today. Before we get to the oneness that I believe God wants us to have, we have to realize there are some cycles in our marriage and our marriages that have to break. And, and here's what I want to do. I want to take you on a, on a trip down uh, memory lane. If we got them, guys, do you have, do you have my, my wedding pictures coming up on 10 years of marriage? Do you see that there? Oh, yes. Look at that mouthful of teeth. And she's gorgeous as well. There it is. Again, we got married in Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, next to a orange orchard. The sunlight was perfect for pictures, uh, and she made them beautiful. It was just an incredible experience. But for those of you that have been married, uh, in your mind, transport yourself with me because I can still, seeing those pictures, I think every couple should have their marriage, their wedding day picture in plain view somewhere in their house because here's what's going to happen. You, all right, you can quit showing them. I don't want to see that of myself no more. Um, when, you, when you go back in your mind, 
to that wedding day. I can remember it was an outdoor wedding, Scottsdale, Arizona. It was gorgeous. And as a guy, you're standing at the top of that, at the, of the aisle, you know, and your palms are sweating and you're nervous and you're like, oh my goodness, like I, I can't wait. You haven't seen her all day. You don't know anything about what's happening. You're like in this tunnel vision of like, where is she? And then all of a sudden the doors swing open and ladies, you're standing behind the doors and they open and there's your Prince Charming. At least that's what Anna told me. No, I'm just kidding. But the doors swing open, and there you see the man of your dreams. Guys, she's right there, and she's walking down an aisle to you. And when she sees you in that moment, there is nothing more important than each other. And you see each other, and it's the union of two becoming one. And it is magical, and it is incredible, and it's an amazing feeling. And then years later, you're asking yourself, what happened? You changed. Cycles happened. Things happened. How do we fix those things? It's, it's three very simple areas. And I want to tell you, I believe every marriage if you will take these three things, you guys who are preparing to get married, this is gold for you. Start writing this down now. Every marriage, if you will take these three things and you will submit them to the Lord and you will only represent Christ through these three things, I believe cycles will be broken. I believe marriages will be restored. I believe God will move in your marriage in a powerful way. Here they are. It's the heart. It's the thoughts. It's the words. It is your heart. It is your thoughts. It is your words. Those three things have the power to break any cycle that you find yourself in. Those three things help, ha, can transform anything that you're experiencing in your marriage right now and bring it to the glory of God. The first one is the heart. It's Ephesians 4 verse 18. He, he says, their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives them because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. 2 Corinthians 2 4 through 11. Uh, this is such a powerful passage on a cycle, the cycle of a heart. It says, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, the heart is anguished. I wrote to you, with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. But if anyone has caused grief, he has grieved me, but all of you, to some extent, not to be too severe. Verse 6, this punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man so that on the contrary you ought rather to forgive and comfort him lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore I urge you reaffirm your love to him. From, for to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. He wraps it around everything. He said this cycle of anguish, resentment, not forgiving, being in sorrow, and pushing into a cycle of sorrow. He's saying, I'm going to test you and see if you're obedient with this in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed you have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us. Catch this. For we are not ignorant of his devices. We are not ignorant of his cycle. We are not ignorant of what he will entrap us in. If we are anguished in heart, we are hardened in heart, we refuse to forgive, and we wallow in sorrow, we fall to this cycle of a broken heart to the cycle of being trapped in our own hurts. My, my son, he is, uh, man, he's awesome. He's crazy, and he's awesome, and he's all things 
crazy. And we, uh, we were a birthday party for our birthday parties. We were driving through the neighborhood the other day, and there was this inflatable in the neighborhood, and it made me think, uh, every birthday party, we have a friend who owns an inflatable company, so we always rent the inflatables. We're that family with inflatable in the front yard, you know, and we just have the kids. If you need it, it's the best babysitter you'll ever have in your life, right? When we can't get a babysitter, we just rent an inflatable, go to lunch, come back, undo the Velcro, and they're, they're still in there, you know? <laughs> no, they're, they're awesome. And so, my son, he was playing in this inflatable, and uh, I remember we were, I was trying to get him inside, and I was like, okay, buddy, you're done. It's over with, and he's like, okay, dad, and so he, we start to go inside, and I click that, that blower, you know, it's got these giant blowers that keep everything going. I, I clicked it off, and what was funny was the thing still kept shape, but the blower was off, and so we get up to the door, and he says, daddy, I want it one more time, and he takes off running, and I'm like, Okay, go ahead. <laughs> and he jumps, and as he leaps in the air, he's a little athletic boy. He's a really good jumper. He jumps up, and you see this orange hair flying in the air, and you see his arms spread, and then he just smack right on the driveway, straight through the thing. It collapsed right on top of him. You can, like, faintly hear his cries in there, you know, because the whole thing is on there. He's like, <laughs> And I was like, oh, and you know how, like, when, they, when they, they hit so hard, they lose all their breath, and they're, they're trying to cry, but they can't make a noise. Like, yeah. it's good. So I'm, I'm like, I run over there, and I'm like pulling the down. I'm trying to find him in there, and I find him, and man, he's, he's bruised up, and he's beat up, and he's, Daddy, what happened? He's like, what happened? And I said, son, it was no longer being filled up. The blower was off. You know, that's what, that's what happens to our heart, right? When we, when we shut off and we harden our heart and we go to a place of anguish of heart and we start keeping a record of everything that they've said to us and all the things that they've called us and all the things that we've asked them to do that they've never done and all of the things that they've done that we never wished that they would do, all of the sudden we begin to callous our heart and when our heart begins to get callous, what was once filling you up is no longer filling you up. So it's like this puffed up, walking around. Yes, everything's great. I'm hiding in secret, but inside my heart is empty. That's the cycle he's talking about here. He's saying through an anguished heart, if you don't forgive, then you will create a cycle of sorrow, of hurt. But then he also gives the remedy. If you caught it inside there, he said two things to do. One, he said, in fact, I tell you to forgive this man. And number two, reaffirm your love for him. Number one, forgive. Number two, reaffirm. If we're to heal the heart, if we're to start breaking the cycle of sorrow, breaking the cycle of anguish, the two things that we have to do is forgive. You've got to forgive. Say, well, I may not have the capacity to forgive. Your capacity to forgive is not based on you. It's based on what Jesus has done for you. And Jesus has forgiven you, so you have the capacity to forgive. We forgive, and then he says, and reaffirm your love. Verse 8, therefore I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. If we can begin this practice over and over, there's some homework for you. Go home and reaffirm your love to your spouse. Maybe you pull out the song you dance to on your wedding day. Oh, yeah. It, Valentine's is coming, right? Tell her earmuffs. I'm going to give you a plan. You did, hey, don't listen, women. Guys, get that song you dance to at your wedding day. And, man, Valentine's Day, surprise her. Have roses ready. Maybe you, you know, get all dressed up and done up. And then you play that song and dance with her like it was your wedding day and reaffirm your love. That's the, the second part of it I think that we miss sometimes is in our hearts we, we tell ourselves, okay, we've forgiven, but we haven't taken what we've placed in our heart of forgiveness and let it out in reaffirmation. So, oh yeah, I forgave, I forgave, I forgave, but the second something happens, I'm biting back because I have forgiven, or at least I thought I have, but I haven't began the process of reaffirmation. We break this cycle of a sorrowful heart through forgiving and reaffirming our love to our spouse. Number two, our thoughts. 
We start with the heart. We got to break these cycles of our heart getting closed off, our heart getting angry, our heart getting hurt, our heart getting frustrated, our heart being in sorrow, our heart being in anguish. And then we move to the thoughts, the things I think about my spouse. Ephesians 4, 21 through 23 says, Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, Throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Verse 23, instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. I love Philippians 4, 8. It says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right. Think about these things. The Lord is telling us to fix our thoughts on these things. How clearly does that apply to marriage? Think about these things. What is true? What is honorable? What is right? What is pure? What is lovely? And what is admirable? Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Another homework assignment for you. Go home and write down for every single one of these what you think about your spouse. What do I think about them that is true? What do I think about them that is honorable? What do I think about them that is right? What do I think about them that is pure? What do I think about them that is lovely? What do I think about them that is admirable? Write those things down and pray those things over them. Those of you that are single, that's, that's your prayer list for your future spouse. I want someone who is true, who is honorable, who is right, who is pure, who is lovely, who is admirable. Listen to me. The thoughts you think about your spouse will become the ways you treat your spouse. The thoughts you think about them will come out in the actions of the way that you treat them. If you think they don't listen to you, then you're always going to treat them like they're not listening to you. If you think that they're angry and they don't care about you, you're going to treat them like they're angry and they don't care about you. If you think they have something against you, you're going to treat them like they, that you think they have something against you. And this cycle of the wrong thoughts, these thoughts that are not of the Lord, but they're of the devil, these thoughts that you didn't have on your wedding day when you were standing at the altar, but these cycles of thoughts have started creating this corruption in your mind that when you look at your spouse, you no longer see your partner, you see your enemy. Because the cycle of thoughts... We've got to break these cycles of thoughts. In fact, listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. In other words, your thoughts should not have you captive. You should have your thoughts captive. You should not be a captive. It's like, it's like when my son starts telling me what to do. Daddy, you go upstairs and you get me a water and bring me a, a strawberry bar. I'm like, that's cute, but I'm dad. Like, no, you don't run this place, right? But yet we let our thoughts run our minds like a four-year-old. We let these negative thoughts, these crazy thoughts, these inappropriate thoughts, these, these drag down thoughts about our spouse, and we let them run even when it's not their intention because we've created this cycle of the wrong thinking. We have to take those captive, and we have to start thinking what is true, what is honorable, what is admirable about our spouse, and we have got to begin praying those things over our spouse because the thoughts that we think will become the actions we take against our spouse. I grew up thinking I was stupid. Some of you may still agree with that, but I I grew up, I I really did. I had ADHD like crazy. Squirrel. Oh, we having a conversation here? I mean, that was my life, right? They gave me Ritalin. I was on Ritalin all through school. I was taking two tablets of Ritalin. I I just, I was, I was ADHD. I was out of control. I had two older brothers that paved a path of destruction before me. So instantly, I would walk into the class, and I already was self-conscious about my inability to really focus on, on these things, or, or what I kept telling myself. You're just, you're an ADHD kid. You're not smart. You're not listening to anything. You're not going to comprehend anything. And then the teacher would be like, oh gosh, you're a Cunningham. I had both your brothers. When do you want to go to the office? Now or when you actually do something bad, you know? It was like, I just had this path. So again, what did I start thinking? I started thinking I was stupid, and I started thinking I was going to get in trouble. Guess what I did? Got bad grades and got in tons of trouble. That's it. Because my thoughts, that's that's the thoughts. That's what I was thinking about myself. That's what I was telling myself the whole time until I had a coach that sat me down 
and challenged me. And I am talking to the core of me, challenged me and said, this is not, I've seen you do work. You just don't try. You're not a C student. You just settle for C's because you ain't trying. He said, if you will try in this class, and we made these push-up problem bets, and I told you all about this, but I'll tell you what it happened. Long story short, I'm doing some things in education now that I never imagined that I would be doing. And that's not bragging on me. I want to tell you something. I didn't all of a sudden get smart. I just quit believing I was stupid. I didn't all of a sudden become some genius. I just quit believing I was stupid. Let me tell you something. To have a great marriage, maybe you just need to quit believing the things you're believing right now about your spouse. Maybe you just need to take those thoughts captive, heal your heart, captivate those thoughts, and begin to hold those thoughts in obedience to Christ, who says you should be thinking things that are admirable, things that are honorable, things that are lovely, things that are pure. Take your thoughts captive, put them before the cross. We heal the heart, we fix our thoughts, and then he ends here with our words. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32 says, And never let ugly or hateful words come from your mouth. You know what never means? Come on, somebody. What's never mean? Hey, you're right. You want to speak Greek? What's never mean in the Greek? Never. Never, never let ugly or hateful words come from your mouth. But instead, I love this imagery. It's why I chose this, this translation. But instead, let your words become beautiful gifts that encourage others. Do this by speaking words of grace to help them. How important is that in a marriage? Verse 30. The Holy Spirit of God has sealed you in Jesus Christ until you experience your full salvation. So never grieve the Spirit of God or take for granted His holy influence in your life. Lay aside bitter words, temper tantrums, revenge, profanity, and insults. But instead be kind and and affectionate toward one another. Has God graciously forgiven you? then graciously forgive one another in the depths of Christ's love. Let me just read 31 through 32 again, because I really need to hear it. And you you may too. Lay aside bitter words, temper tantrums, revenge, profanity, and insults, but instead be kind and affectionate towards one another. Has God graciously forgiven you? Then graciously forgive one another in the depths of Christ's love. Uh, I want to I end here to set us up for next week. Um, my, my daughter, so I told you about my son, my daughter uh, had this great idea last week to make a swimming pool for her Barbies in our upstairs sink, Right? So I pulled out that little stopper that's in there, you know, because I didn't want the sink to flood. No, no worries. She had a way around that. She took a roll of toilet paper and stuffed it down the sink and stuffed up that sink. So uh, then she turned on the water and what was started as a pool for her Barbies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay right there, guys. What started as a pool for her Barbies uh, actually turned out to flood our entire second floor of our house. I, I'm working in my office, and Anna calls me, and I said, hey, hey, babe, what's up? And she said, oh, my gosh, there's water all over upstairs. And I said, okay. I said, well, then go downstairs, get my shop back, and start sucking up water. And so she's like, where is it? And I'm walking her through it. And she opened up our laundry room, which is right below that room, and there was water dripping through the ceiling. And she said, Luke, oh, my gosh, there's water dripping onto the floor. I said, are you on the first floor? She said, yes. And I said, okay, I'll be home in a second. We got a major problem, right? So I go home and, and I told her on the phone that I said, I said, babe, prepare yourself because I'm about to rip that house apart, right? I'm channeling my inner chip gains right now. <laughs> or property brothers, thanks to Scott last week. I'm channeling my inner demo day is coming. I know what the process looks like, right? She's never seen it. I said, honey, prepare yourself 
I'm ripping the house to shreds. So I get home and I look and sure enough, there is water. I think we got a, a couple of them. What, that, that's just our, our laundry room. That was just the start of it. What else you guys got? I had to rip out. That's behind the laundry room. I was ripping out sheetrock everywhere. Man, I had a pry bar, I had a razor blade. Just wah, nothing cooler than, well, I guess when it's your own house, it's kind of not fun. But you just wah, ripping that stuff. What else do we got? Do we have anything else? Bless my sweet daughter. No, but that's just a small picture of, I was tearing out the ceiling. Anywhere I saw a little bit of water, I was ripping out sheetrock all over my house, right? And so I did, I, in the process of doing that, I saw Anna. She, she came, and I mean, I had pulled the, the washer and dryer out, disconnected them. I was ripping the laundry room to shreds, and there was like sheetrock, wet sheetrock, just nasty, you know, it's, it's, it's chalky, and then there's chalk everywhere and dust and she is she walked into the laundry room and I mean it was like and, and she said to me and I was just like don't mess with me I'm in the midst of it you know and she said she said honey she said is our house going to be destroyed I said babe I got this figured out don't worry about a thing when a preacher tells you that about construction you better start calling somebody right because you're about to mess some things up. So I'm ripping it, and I said, babe, don't worry about it. But I could tell, because she'd never seen it. We'd never had to go to that extent in our house before. She was concerned, like major concern. So I get it all ripped out, and then uh, thankfully, Mike came, came over, and we started patching, and we started putting mud up and taping everything and getting it all put back together. And I remember there was this moment, you know, the, the look of despair on my wife. I remember she was just like, she literally thought, well, house is done. He's ripping holes through walls, you know. But then there came a point where we got it patched up. We got the mud on there. The last coat we did, sanded it down. We're getting it ready for texture. And I remember I, I went, I said, hey, babe, have you been in here yet? And she said, no. And I said, come on, come on in here. And she's like, I, I don't think I can handle it. I don't, I don't really want to go. I said, no, no, no. Come check this out, right? I'm like proud, man. I got it all figured out, you know? I mean, Mike did it all, but I'd take credit for it. And so I was like, come on. <clears throat> I was like, come in here. And so she comes in there, and I remember when she walked around, she was just kind of, you know, really upset. And then she walked around and saw the patches. And when she saw the patch, she started to smile again. She started to, she started to get happy again. And I was like, look, it's going to be good, right? And she was like, yeah, it looks like, like nothing really kind of happened. It's going to be, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be put back together again. And now we've gotten to this place where I'm showing her, I still got to cut this out. And she's like, go for it, cut it out because then we'll patch it and then we'll fix it. And I know my man can fix that sheetrock, you know, like, oh. but here's what you need to know. You may be in a place today where you feel like there's just been holes ripped through your marriage. You feel like maybe from a calloused heart that it's just closed off or from thoughts that these thoughts have just punctured hole after hole all over your mirror or the words that you have spoken to each other have pierced through walls and have caused so much destruction. Here is what you need to hear today, that by the grace of God, by the forgiveness of Christ, by the life in his word, you can heal your heart. You can fix your thoughts, and you can change your words. And if you do those three things, you'll begin to break cycles in your marriage. That's what I'm praying for. That's what we're believing for as a church. Everybody, thanks again for joining us. We believe God has something great for your life, and we hope this message encourages you to take the next step in your faith. Have a great week.